Hello, and thank you, coming, thank you for coming to this session on prehistoric archaeology and this paper <clears throat> entitled Petroglyphs and Desert Kites at Wasad Pools, Jordan, um, with me, Chad Hill, and my co-authors, York Rowe and Gary Rolfson and uh, Alex Wass. Petroglyphs are well known in Eastern Jordan and have been variously documented across a range of sites and time periods. <clears throat> Intensive documentation of hundreds of petroglyphs at the site of Wasad Pools in the Black Desert of Eastern Jordan record animals, humans, hunting traps, and geometric designs that provide a wealth of information about the people who lived here in the later Neolithic and their place in the larger landscape. In this paper, we will discuss the petroglyphs we recorded at the site at the landscape level with drones and photogrammetry and at the local scale through the construction of a database combined with GPS recording and terrestrial photogrammetry. Mapping these depictions highlights their typological distributions and associations and their relationship to the landscape and the animals um, and features depicted. The depictions of hunting traps in particular provide clues about the importance and social role of hunting in the region during the later Neolithic. This paper focuses on one of the two areas investigated over the last, over the last several years by the Eastern Body Archaeological Project. Those two areas are along the mesas, um, along Wadi Katafi to the west here, <clears throat> uh, and uh, the site of Wissad Pools further to the east here. Um, both sites are located in the Harat al-Sham, the Black Desert, <clears throat> so-called because, because of the large expanse of exposed basalt boulders that color the whole landscape black. It is an arid and marginal area, rarely discussed in the present or in the past, except as a region traversed by civilizations, armies, and traders. The Eastern Body Archaeological Project has been working in the region for the last several years now. The broader project goal is to record and study the architecture, artifacts, and petroglyphs um, at these two sites and integrate that data with biological and paleoclimatic data in order to understand human occupations and the use of the region. We are particularly, particularly interested in preliminary evidence suggesting that a fluorescence of human activity in the Black Desert was possible during the later prehistory because of environmental conditions that were significantly cooler and wetter than in the modern situation. At Wasad Pools, um, at the eastern edge of the Black Desert, there are nine natural and man-made pools that collect and hold water in a short wadi that drops um, only about 10 meters from the plateau up here down to the Ka or Arabian mud flat down here, about two kilometers away. So you get this series of natural pools and a series of steps going down uh, to the Ka. Hundreds of structures um, are concentrated over an, er over an area of approximately 1.5 square kilometers, including dwellings, tumuli, tower tombs, and structures of unknown function, um, all made from the local basalt. <clears throat> In addition to the res residential ritual and pastoral structures, nearby there are also desert kites. These are extensive hunting traps, um, which I'll talk more about, as well as wheels, which are so named because they resemble a wheel with a circular perimeter rim and a central hub with radiating lines of spokes, and which may have functioned as non uh, residential complexes or burial centers. Um, so this is an aerial view of the site. The pools are here in the distance, and most of the main uh, structures are on the eastern edge of the um, uh, site here. So as I said, one of the most spectacular features in the area are these desert kites. These are spread throughout the Black Desert and beyond, and they number in, in the thousands across the wider region. There are some examples of desert kites. Um, these are some examples of the desert kites uh, taken by the excellent Apame project, where you can see what they look like. So you get this enclosure shape and then radiating uh, lines all opening to the east where animals would have been driven into the enclosure and then killed inside of here. The desert kites are so named because of their shape uh, when seen from the air by the early pilots flying over the region that they looked like uh, uh, children's toy kites. And all the kites um, are linked by a series, of, a series of meander walls, so they form these long chains across the region. They all face in the same direction, opening to the east, uh, and they often make use of the natural topography that likely would have tended to help guide animals into the enclosures for hunting. Taken together, these kites are best understood as huge machines for catching game and represent a major investment in labor to construct and likely acted as an important tool um, across an, an enormous span of time uh, in the region. So here's another one. As at Wissad Pools, as I already mentioned, there is a large concentration of structures mostly on the east side uh, of the natural pools. So here, most of the ones in this area have been numbered and mapped. The pecked rock art at the site is concentrated densely around the pools, particularly, so the pools are here, 
and have a better view here. Yep. Um, particularly around a few galleries that overlook uh, a series of the pools. So this hill that we've named Neolithic Hill, uh, there's one gallery here and a series of galleries here. They really concentrate on pools two and three uh, here. This is what the pools look like from the ground. Um, this is the most upper pool, pool one, and is where the project is usually camped during our field season. So this is from high up on um, the hill, high, uh, looking at our the main part of our campsite where we do cooking. And you can see that even late in the summer when this picture was taken, probably sometime in June, there's still water naturally being retained um, in, in the pools. Excavations at the site have revealed uh, large complex structures used repeatedly um, <clears throat> over the course of nearly a millennia of, of use during the later Neolithic. A large amount of artifacts found in that structure in these structures include uh, tools, debitage, and hundreds of arrowheads. The vast majority of these are um, small transverse arrowheads. Here's what the another one, the other structure looks like. Um, so <clears throat> these are what the transverse arrowheads look like. Um, and such an abundance of arrowheads does strongly suggest the importance of hunt hunting in the economy of the site. There's relatively little pottery in these structures, but uh, that which we did find looks like the well-known pottery Neolithic type called Yarmukian pottery. This photo represents nearly the entire assemblage from several seasons of excavation across multiple structures. There's, there's just very little um, pottery here. Other special finds include an active bead industry using local materials such as limestone and daba marble, as well as shells and carnelian <clears throat> transported from some distance. Plant remains were identified for Rasad in the nearby Wadi Katadi sites by Jan Ramsey. Uh, pollen identified as bulrush indicates marshy conditions. Additional plant genus identifications, including amoebias, milk vetches, and stone crops, which all flower in the late spring, suggest occupations of the site in the late spring. <clears throat> But the most interesting find uh, from an archaeobotanical perspective is evidence of ficus, uh, ficus carica or figs at the site. Not only have the seeds of fig been identified, but also carbonized fragment um, of the flesh. <coughs> fig is the first domesticated species in the Near East dating to the early Neolithic period, though it is difficult to differentiate the wild species from the domesticated variety. Either way, both have significant water requirements that may point to a wetter environment in the late Neolithic. However, figs may not have been grown locally since they also have excellent storage properties and could have been transported over long distances. Perhaps even more surprising is this is a discovery by Britta Lawrenson um, of Tabor Oak. Uh, the presence of this species in the landscape would suggest that rainfall was significantly higher than the hyper-arid conditions um, of the present, where there's less than 50 millimeters of annual precipitation. Um, and there are, the, these trees don't grow anywhere nearby uh, in the present. Uh, the nearest oak is nearly 200 kilometers away. And so the presence of oak at the site doesn't necessarily mean that it was collected locally, but it's possible that stands of oak were near, located nearby and that uh, acorns and the resources that would have been present because there was enough water to be supporting oak uh, would have played in a, uh, um, a relatively large role in, in subsistence of the site. The photo analysis from um, the structures, excavated structures is ongoing, so only a small sample has been analyzed to date, but it is dominated by gazelle, <coughs> circa 50% of the bones, nearly half are, are uh, gazelle, followed by hare at around 25%, and then um, what are presumably domestic caprins, sheep and goat, accounting for about 10% of identify, identified total. Bird bones are also present along with small numbers of fox and at least one domestic dog. Um, there are also a series of um, felid elements, including one Syrian lion claw that was recovered um, in one of the structures. The relative frequencies here are likely to change as the analysis continues, um, and there may be differences according to phase within the structures um, once we have uh, control on more of the material across the phases within the, within the structures. But it's notable, uh, for reasons that will become clear, that there are no larger wild fauna beyond gazelle identified in the structure thus far. Um, this is true also for the relatively few other published sites that might be contemporary with um, these sites. Uh, five dates from the site fit within the range of um, approximately 6,500 Cal BC to um, uh, 5760, with a possible gap for the period between approximately 6,400 and 6,000. These late, uh, late Neolithic dates fit with the flint arrowheads and rare pieces of Yamukian pottery to really tie it to um, the late Neolithic period. One of the most striking features of the site, though, are the numerous petroglyphs that are visible on the landscape and which cluster around the, several of the pools um, in the area that we labeled Neolithic Hill. 
Starting in 2014, we undertook a series, uh, we undertook a survey of the petroglyphs at the site with the goal of building a database of all the rock art we could identify that tracked details about each one, tracked them spatially, and recorded them visually. We recorded each petroglyph in the database, took at least one photograph of every feature, um, and, and recorded a GPS or total station point for each one. So we, we used uh, digital tools to record each one of these petroglyphs, and they're all on these kind of large basalt boulders throughout this region. This is looking down uh, across at Neolithic Hill over here. We recorded 435 discrete petroglyphs in all. The vast majority of these depict animals, the most common being ibex with their clearly identifiable curved horns. So you get, you have the really, um, really apparent, uh, the nice ridged structure of ibex horns here are also frequently very clearly depicted in the animals in the rock art. So you can see these ridges along the sharply curved uh, horns here. Most of the animal identification is because of distinctive horn shape because often the animals are um, not really well defined um, in their outline. Um, here you see hunters with additional ibex. You get people, a human figure, and then a series of animals being hunted. Um, we also get um, other animals that are identified primarily via horn shape include oryx with their very straight horns, like this. You get nice and straight pointy horns. Um, and animals that may be either adex or kudu, um, they, which have very similar horn shape. So you get this recurving shape, which is um, very clear, but then there's quite different markings between the kudu and the adex, and it's often unclear whether uh, any markings are being pecked inside of the, the body of the animal. Oh, sorry, here. We also get uh, some species of um, probably cows, uh, possibly oryx, also with their large horns like this, sometimes uh, visible in kind of plan view for the shape of the horn rather than um, profile view. And then we get other animals that can be harder to identify often because they're kind of um, either they've been defaced or they're just kind of blobby shapes. Um, so get maybe a hyena or a lion something here and um, more ibex. Uh, these have nice and goaty beards. The next most common depiction is human figures, which can include people by themselves or in relationship to animals and structures. <clears throat> human figures uh, include both figures that appear to be uh, female and that appear to be male. And they can be uh, found in hunting scenes or by themselves. So we find humans that are grouped with animals and sometimes within uh, the hunting trap depictions, which we'll talk about next. And sometimes we get people by themselves. There's apparent two or three um, women depicted on this rock. And another male figurine possibly holding uh, some kind of tool. The next most common uh, depiction uh, are images of these desert kites. So the depictions are commonly found on the flat faces of boulders. Uh, they use the one, often one entire face of the stone, and they show a series of cells around the perimeter of the face, uh, sometimes extending around to an adjacent face. Sometimes these depictions include the arms of the trap, so like this, I think, uh, showing the opening the animals would have been driven into. Um, and, and they've really helped make it clear that, that these are depicting uh, kites. Often the cells follow the natural topography of the stone. As I said, this is probably both because it's easier to, to peck them into the stone if you're following ridge lines of the stone, but also possibly because the kites themselves, the real ones, also follow the topographic shape of the earth to make it easier to construct. So it's probably both easier to make the petroglyphs this way and easier to build the real kites this way. Um, very frequently, the uh, petroglyphs involve uh, incorporate natural depressions in the stone they're being carved onto into the cells. So that's what I'm zooming on here. You can see there's this natural hole in the rock and it's been placed inside one of these cells. And this may mimic the fact that in real life, these cells um, would have been excavated below the surrounding surface. So this is kind of highlighting the fact that the, the cells are, are deeper. Um, so yeah, you can see that incorporated here. The final major category of petroglyphs we identified was called, we called geometric. Uh, only 12 of these were identified, generally much more clustered than the other uh, types. 
And often these are on uh, smaller stones that at least possibly would have made them portable, unlike everything else that's on these very large boulders. And it, I think at least one of these, it appeared like it had rolled down um, the slope of the hill. These are also generally um, incised more deeply, and so it's possible uh, that these are, are a later addition uh, to the corpus of the region. Um, here's another one of these geometric patterns. You can see how deeply carved uh, these patterns are. Some petroglyphs we suspect were drawn later. These include depictions of camels, which utilize a different pecking technique and occasionally include Safiatic inscriptions, uh, uh, which are incised much more deeply into the stone. Um, additionally, some petroglyphs have been altered at some point, which is clear, uh, where there are um, originally pecked uh, depictions and then incis incised uh, additions have been added. So people have scratched new shapes into the rock around where they, they were originally pecked. So it makes it obvious that they're later additions. It should not be surprising that people were adding and uh, altering the petroglyphs through time. We can be sure that people have continued to add to and alter the petroglyphs in the region, even up into the present. Um, although it is found at Wadi Katafi, a great example of this uh, is um, this petroglyph here of a nice truck overlooking uh, the wadi, which you can see in the present at, at, uh, near Maitland's Mesa. Um, and this is a depiction of a Toyota Dyna, a common truck used by Bedouin who still visit the region during parts of the year. And they did a really nice job of making it really clear that this is what they're drawing, right? So the general summary of the 400 plus um, petroglyphs that we found, we have the vast majority are animals. Um, of that, uh, the majority of those are ibex or unidentified. Um, and kites account for, um, kites and, and individual cells account for about 20% of the total assemblage. In addition to the collection of point data, we also collected photogrammetry data with multi-rotor and fixed wing drones to build orthophotos and digital, eleva digital elevation models of the site to help explore the relationship between where the different kinds of petroglyphs were placed. This is an example of an orthophoto showing the distribution of the kinds of petroglyphs laid on top. So we can see different types of petroglyphs and you can see where they were in relationship to the shape um, locations of the pools. Ultimately, there was relatively little patterning in the distribution of types and subtypes of petroglyphs with the exception of uh, the probably later camels and possibly later geometric designs. Uh, the location of most of the rocks um, the location of most of the rock art likely reflects uh, to a large degree where there's good rocks for drawing um, petroglyphs. So the really nice, flat, smooth boulders tend to be near the pools in the first place. <clears throat> However, especially on Neolithic Hill here, the ideal material does seem to continue, continue away from the wide to the west while the petroglyphs do not. So it also seems likely that these depictions of animals and game traps are intentionally placed around this natural resource. And you can see this if we look at uh, a hill-shaded uh, digital elevation model. The petroglyphs are really on the slopes that face um, the pools. So they're probably intentionally placed to some degree around this natural resource, the pools, where people may have been congregated to watch the animals um, coming to access the rare natural resource represented by the pools themselves, while also being, a, being able to look out into the distance. So if you're standing here on Neolithic Hill, you can see down into the pool. You can also see a really far way to the south here. Um, and, and you can also almost certainly see uh, at least one of the, the animal traps, the uh, desert kites from here. So this location was likely a focal point for human and animal activities and interaction. So it is extremely interesting that the kites um, are structures that are being depicted in the rock art. Uh, in many cases, the traps are clearly depicted and sometimes include human figures and animals in and around them. Wasad Pools is located within one of the many chains of desert kites located throughout the Black Desert. These chains of traps are a series of traps linked by the a series of meander walls uh, and spread over tens of kilometers. So we have this nice um, Google Earth imagery um, from an excellent article on surveying these with uh, Google Earth, and the chains have been marked out. Um, this is by Kemp and Malabe. The chains have been marked out um, in color coding, so you can see that uh, a single chain passes all the way through the um, the entire width of Jordan. And I've plotted them more closely here in this map. You can see Wasad Pools is here, right near one of the uh, traps, <clears throat> and at the end, really, of two of the local chains. Well, I mean, they actually do continue here. 
Uh, so this is again what the kites look like. This is one of the ones near Wadi Qatafi seen from drone. You can see what the trap looks like and you got the walls running off that way. Um, and then meandering walls running here and here to connect to the next uh, trap. From the surface, these walls don't look very impressive generally. Uh, and in fact, for much of the length, the guiding walls in these traps probably relied more on the gazelle herd mentality to follow breaks in the topography naturally rather than being an actual obstacle or barrier that they would have not been able to traverse. So in many cases, you might walk over these walls in the present without knowing that you'd walked over a, a, a prehistoric animal trap. But the fact that uh, Wasad is located in the heart of one of these densely packed regions um, of these chains of kites and the frequency of representation of those kites in the hunting scenes in the petroglyphs suggests strongly that these were that these were important to the people who created uh, the petroglyph corpus in the first place. So we wanted to try to understand how many kites could be reached easily from Wasad Pool since we knew that there were at least a few that were immediately adjacent. Uh, so we did some estimation in ArcGIS. First, I digitized all the traps, enclosures, and walls that uh, we could see in existing free satellite imagery, and that's uh, marked out here in blue. All anthropogenic wall. Um, Fragments have been marked. Then we created a cumulative cost surface using uh, SRTM DEM data, uh, digital elevation data, uh, and used Neolithic Hill, the very center of um, the analysis here, as uh, the center point, as the starting point. It was then possible to generate a series of contour lines showing estimated time in hours to walk to all points in the region. And then this was used to investigate uh, how many kites you could reach to in different um, periods of time. Um, I thought the numbers were really uh, startling. From, from Neolithic Hill, uh, an average walking person, according to this um, idealized model, could reach uh, two traps in less than an hour. So you would just stroll over to two different traps from, from there very easily. You could reach 14 traps in up to two hours. And in the longest time I looked at, really it's a day's worth of walking in up to five hours, you could reach 74 different enclosures. Um, so, so this, this presence and number of kite depictions then shows that the location of the site relative to traps is probably not coincidental. The site location reflects an intentional choice within the network of kites. It must have been an ideal base for utilizing the, the extensive trap system. So there is a fundamental difficulty uh, in, in connecting all the dots that we're talking about here. Um, between the excavations, the petroglyphs themselves, and the trap system. The rock art at Wasad depicts a range of wild species and hunting traps on a landscape that appears to have been mostly occupied during the late Neolithic. The rock art corpus and the late Neolithic site of Wasad are both located within walking distance of many of these kite traps. But the animals associated with all of these features do not seem to match up. The gazelles are largely the fauna, gazelle is largely the fauna found in the excavated structures at Wasad, but larger game animals are mostly those animals depicted in the rock art uh, within the traps. But most scholars agree that the traps themselves are most likely used for hunting gazelle and not hunting the larger game that are depicted in the petroglyphs. So there are several possible explanations for how these things connect. Um, first, finding no bones from species like kudu, adex, boss, ibex, and oryx is not indicative that these species were absent from the landscape. The depiction of animals in petroglyphs is intentional and heavily mediated by culture. So this likely reflects symbolic value as much as it does economic value. These species may have been present in the landscape, though in very low numbers compared to the availability of gazelle. And inhabitants of Wasad are likely to have invested considerable time building and operating the traps. If they were as efficient at catching gazelle as it seems likely, then it may not have been worthwhile to catch the other game, even if they were sort of the most prized uh, species on the landscape. Similarly, the discrepancy between the animals identified in the uh, um, faunal assemblage and the animals identified in the petroglyphs might reflect the seasonality of the site. Even though the large structures at Wasad pools represent significant, significant labor invest, investment, these are the buildings at Wasad, and probably recurrent use of the site over long periods, the site was probably used only seasonally by mobile inhabitants. Hunting might have focused on gazelle, possibly with the aid of the network of kites, during the portion of the year that the inhabitants uh, were at Wasad pools, and other species that are depicted in the Petroglyphs might have been hunted at other times. Even, those animals, even though those animals were not being butchered, consumed, and discarded at Wasad, they may still have been higher ranked or more prized and thus more likely to be depicted on the petroglyphs at the site. But lastly, because of the difficulty in precisely dating either the petroglyphs um, or the kites, it is possible that the use of the structures at Wasad, the creation of the petroglyphs, and the construction and use of the kites may not overlap as precisely as circumstantial evidence suggests. The kites likely remained in use over a very large period of time and represent a major investment of human labor. 
So it is likely that many of the chains of kites, including possibly the ones around Wasad pools, were used for several millennia. And since the petroglyphs cannot be accurately dated either, and at least some of the art on the landscape, camel Sephardic inscriptions come from later periods, it is possible that even if both of the, um, both the people who occupied the structures and the people who made the petroglyphs used the kites, these were made at very different times by different people in different environmental conditions. So the petroglyphs at, uh, at Wasad help us to understand the relationship between people living at the site and their social and economic interaction with the landscape through the animals they hunted and the traps they built to do it. The massive system of animal traps must represent a huge investment in physical labor for construction, operation, and maintenance, but must also have re represent an important system for creating and maintaining social systems um, and been a huge part of the annual subsistence strategy for the people living here. There remain questions to be answered about this landscape and these features, and our ongoing goal is to complete the survey uh, and mapping of Wissad pools, excavate other structures that may have been different from the Neolithic buildings already excavated, and expand our analysis of kites in and around the area to improve the dating and understanding of their construction. Thank you very much. And thank you also um, to our funders and to the large number of volunteers and students who have worked on the project through the years. <laughs>